Well, it's a Tuesday, so good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night to everyone, wherever you may be, somewhere in our lovely planet. Well, thanks so much for joining us live here for Serverless Office Hours. Again on Tuesday, streaming on Twitch. Thanks for joining us or YouTube Serverless Land, also via LinkedIn Live. I'm Julian Wynn. I'm a developer advocate here on the Serverless team at AWS, and I'm joined with two awesome gurus who I'm so happy to be able to chat to today. Uh, in no particular order, Luca, a, a, an expert in AWS and all things Lambda. Yeah, you've been on a service office hours before, so welcome back. For people who don't know you, tell us what what's uh, what, what does Luca do in the world of AWS? Oh, uh, a ton of things. <laughs> uh, so uh, thank you for having me again. Uh, it's a pleasure being pleasure. here. Uh, uh, so always great. Um, I'm a serverless specialist, and therefore I'm helping our customers uh, with uh, all the challenges that they're facing with serverless. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's three years that I uh, joined AWS, uh, three years, a few months. Um, quite enjoyable so far, the ride. And uh, I have the pleasure to see quite a lot of uh, interesting workloads. So I hope that uh, we continue this way. Okay, excellent. And I know it's all the service kind of things, but you're also quite an expert on micro front ends and you've told the sort of front end thing and you've written a book about it as well. So um, yeah, there's a whole other whole other world of serverless to explore. Yeah, that, that's my second life. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've only got a, one, a brain for one life, but um, uh, yeah, that's why we've got, that's why people like Luca who've got more than one brain for more than one life. So, uh, and Matt, you're based in, uh, in uh, North Carolina. So yeah, welcome to Office Hours. Your first time as well. You're also a principal solutions architect. So yeah, tell us um, how your journey has come to AWS. Oh, you bet. So uh, again, my name is Matt Diamond. I'm a solutions architect. Julian mentioned um, I'm based in Charlotte, North Carolina. We're with AWS about four and a half years. Prior to this role, I worked a very similar role at Microsoft for about seven years. And, you know, just super happy to be here and uh, talk about Lambda. Cool. You've been you've been clouding forever. So and Luca and I are both in London. I'm trying to think. Uh, I think if I'm waving in that direction, then I'm actually waving across London at Luca. So we know where each other are. Uh, before we get back to all the awesome stuff that Luca and Matt have to talk about uh, with Lambda today. Uh, yeah, just last week, uh, it was uh, with Lambda as well, all about refactoring Java applications. So a real good deep dive from Mark and Max talking about a whole bunch of performance optimizations with Java and a whole bunch of things you can do to use less code. So you can use other AWS services. So that is on our serverless land YouTube channel, channel along with all other service Office Hours episodes. And there's a whole, you know, years full of back uh, catalog with a whole bunch of cool things that it's worth uh, you looking at. In terms of what's new, um, yes, yeah, some kind of things. Uh, API Gateway, the second run up, now supports TLS 1.3. I remember this once being the bane of my life when I worked in enterprises when any TLS version was bumped and updated, trying to make sure everything was updated. Well, use API Gateway, sort of Tick the box, yet yeah, that's done. So <laughs> makes things uh, uh, make things uh, much easier. Uh, so yeah, that's uh, just one of the interesting things. You can see they're on the list. A few other kind of things. Uh, Amazon Kinesis Data Fire Hose um, has been re renamed. So it's Amazon Data Fire Hose. Uh, they dropped the Kinesis uh, name because Kinesis does a whole bunch of other things. So if you weren't aware, aware of that, that is also interesting. And just the other one further down, actually, like the SQS has got an extended client library for Python. So Python developers for payloads up to two gig. So if you're using SQS, you can now use payloads up to two gig, which can be super useful for many workloads. Uh, the AWS Compute blog, which we do a whole bunch of things as one of the blogs with things on serverless. And um, the top one was also about uh, replatforming the Java applications. A lot of the information about that from Dennis. And yeah, a really cool use case I have mentioned before about uh, EventBridge and AppSync. Josh Kahn wrote a really good blog post about that. Everybody thinks or has this, um, has this perception maybe that EventBridge, oh, it's asynchronous. It must be all slow and everything. Ha ha. This is really uh, cool to be able to get uh, EventBridge to send things to AppSync, which is a GraphQL subscription, and update your front ends really, really quickly. So that's really useful and a whole sort of open my eyes to a whole bunch of other use cases. Um, it is AWS summit season, which is coming up. Um, yeah, thick and fast, a whole bunch of content on one or two days. I think there are a few also uh, that this list is going to expand as more, more summits coming on. Um, I will be actually speaking at the London summit on the 24th of April. So if you are around, uh, come and say hi. And yeah, just lots of uh, summits, really good places to learn about a whole bunch of things uh, to do with AWS. A little bit more uh, uh, smaller, I suppose, than a whole big summit is GoTo in AWS. GoTo is a, a conference that we're partnering up to to do a repeat of EDA Day, so Event Driven Architectures Day. And that's going to be in London again, and this is going to be on May the 14th. And I know Matt was at the one in Nashville last year in 
in Nashville, obviously. And Lucas, I think Luke, Luca was the one in London before. So yeah, EDA Day is really, really great. A whole bunch of really good speakers, and it's going to be focused on a building event driven applications. Yeah, super interesting day uh, right in the center of London, the code node on May the 14th. Uh, so sign up. The tickets have just been uh, released. So it'll be super cool to see you uh, to see you there. Uh, some learning guides, and I spotted I haven't put the link on again, but serverlessland.com slash learn, a whole bunch of really opinionated, interesting learning guides. Anton and Debasis have put together this one on building service applications with Terraform. And also, uh, awesome Uma Ramados has also integrating step functions with containerized workloads. So yeah, super useful uh, guides along with a whole lot of others, and that's on serverlessland.com slash learn. But today we are talking all about Lambda performance tuning. And before I just switch over to uh, Luca and Matt, remember we are live here on Service Office Hours. So send us your questions, uh, send us your comments. Uh, we have someone, uh, Daniel Abib from Brazil. Daniel is awesome. Daniel helps to do a whole bunch of translations into Portuguese. And he's absolutely right that, uh, well, Luca and Matt are certainly the rock stars. So yeah, uh, let us know where you're from. Uh, send us your questions or comments about Lambda, even what you're using it for, the cool things you're doing. But, you know, today we're talking about Lambda performance tuning. Tuning. We all think Lambda is super performant and super cool, and there's some cool stuff that you can do to do that. So uh, I'm not actually sure who's going to be kicking off first. I didn't even ask that question. I, I think it's going to be me. Yeah, you bet. Excellent. So Tell us about Lambda and performance. You bet. So we're going to talk a little bit about kind of the Lambda life cycle. We're going to talk through an unoptimized application, and we're going to do a little bit of performance tuning and kind of show you what went on when we did performance tune, did performance tuning around a, specifically a, a kind of an unoptimized application? Then we're going to go and talk about some of you know what would we do to make that a better application and more performant, and we'll kind of uh, have a discussion from there. So we're going to start off talking a little bit about Lambda under the hood. So, so this is all just theoretical. We're not just talking about oh, you know, this is actually a a sort of application that you've built that you sort of improved, so people can actually try some of these things at home. I love that's that right. Approach. So cool. we we exactly right. So we went through and we built an unop unoptimized application, one that wasn't performing very well, and we kind of took some baseline measurements, made some improvements, and then we went through and, and reevaluated it to make certain that we could see how it was doing. Cool. Awesome. So. Uh, when we talk about Lambda under the hood, we look at Lambda itself, you know, Lambda is a sophisticated service, but really what we were looking at is we're trying to focus in on this, this concept of these micro VMs in the sandboxes. And those micro VMs in the sandboxes, um, they can be in, in any AZ, obviously, unless they're VPC attached. And we're looking at taking, you know, from a, a resource or getting some type of um, event coming in, from either the, uh, that are event source mapped or sync or async, and they're being sent into these workers that's managing the micro VMs and the sandboxes. And so what we wanna talk about is kind of that, that life cycle, what, what's gonna happen. And so we're gonna look at a, a sequence diagram for a moment. And we're gonna take a look at the sequence diagram and we're gonna show that life cycle. And at the very beginning, we're gonna talk about that initialization phase. And this is where that sandbox is set up. You're going to it's going to download code and it's going to load things uh, if that you might need uh, like a parameter for a parameters from parameters. Once it's set up, you're going to have that invoke phase, and that's where the sandbox is established and able to handle requests over and over again. And so we really wanted to look at the two areas that we could optimize. So let's take a look at that as we promised an unoptimized solution. And this is a pretty standard application. It's uh, it's really, it's just an API that's calling Lambda. It's interacting with an Aurora database. And in between it is RDS proxy for managing uh, those connections. So you're not having to write the code to handle that because nobody likes writing uh, that type of code. So we have a service that handles that for you. And the Lambda is interacting with things like CloudWatch and X-Ray and IAM, and even Systems Manager Parameter Store. And so probably everybody has seen something very similar to this or has written something like this in the past. And one of the things we're gonna call out here is that we're using an x86 architecture. And we're gonna to get to the, when we get to optimize, we're gonna talk about some of the cost benefits that we saw. So we've taken our, um, our application, we kind of have an idea of, of what we're setting up. But one thing we wanna talk about is uh, making some suggestions around fetching parameters 
at the initialization phase to have a store inside the sandbox that reduces that chattiness. So keep in mind, right, that these sandboxes, they're ephemeral and they can be reclaimed at the, by the Lambda service at some point. So it's not gonna be stored there for hours. So, you know, it's kind of safe to assume um, that at some point your secrets or um, other parameters are gonna get refetched. So some other suggestions that we kind of start off with or some, some baseline suggestions that we make are that you really wanna minify your code a hard thing to say three times over and um you know if you're not doing it here uh, you're doing that in your um, infrastructure as code of so of choice so the minifying um, is, yeah. is that just what is a minifying for because i know there's obviously uh well uh, lambda performance and lambda cost obviously tied very closely together so you're not just talking about performance in terms of you know an a behind an api and everything but the, you know the, the short your lambda function runs there's a cost uh, implication to that is this minifying about reducing the amounts of code to make things smaller so they load quicker is that the sort of minifica minification you see i can't even do it three times either the minification <laughs> it uh, is a reason <laughs> that's going to be the challenge say minification three times it, it is, and actually, Luca gets to talk a little bit about that in, in a little while about kind of what what we saw when we not only minified, but we were able to uh, do some bundling. I don't know, Luca, if you okay. want to share early yeah, on so your, your part. Absolutely. So first of all, uh, there is uh, a common things uh, when uh, you build, let's say, JavaScript uh, applications uh, back end or, or uh, uh, front end doesn't matter really. On front end, we are quite common. Uh, it's quite common building, let's say, minified code. Uh, not always, but often. Uh, but on the back end, uh, you know, uh, because we are loading the code on the fly, and uh, when we are creating for the first time the sandbox. Uh, obviously, the smaller is uh, the code size, the faster will be available and will be storing memory and start to execute uh, your function. So one of the, the tricks that we usually recommend is instead of having, uh, let's say, large files or large bundle size, we're trying to squeeze uh, the same functionality in uh, less code as possible. So one of the techniques uh, when we're using Node.js or TypeScript with Node.js uh, is uh, minify, minify your code. Okay, uh, it's an interesting point. I like the way you framed it of the optimizations that people do on the front end, because obviously you want to have fast, responsive web applications. You know, just using some of the same techniques on the back end as well to also have that same optimization. Yes, cool. and, and just in this uh, case, just uh, sorry, I add one thing, Julian, if you don't mind. Uh, so this oh, cool. this uh, implementation is, uh, in my opinion, is is pretty cool because we have created an abstraction on top of uh, the CDK construct of, of the function. Uh, so this dedicated to nodes. So as you can see, the props are Node.js function uh, props, and uh, we expose basically ES build. Uh, that is by default uh, the bundler that we decide to have on, uh, on CDK. Uh, and therefore, all these capabilities you see, the bundling part basically is the uh, abstraction or the, um, uh, let's say, uh, the abstraction of the, the API that we create for that we expose from uh, ES Build, uh, but later on we will see even more uh, APIs that are available uh, through Flex. Okay. Excellent. And yeah, I just did, um, I put a link down at the bottom of the screen for loads more information on how sort of Lambda works under the hood. We we're talking about sandboxes and workers and reuse and all that kind of thing. Uh, that's a reInvent talk that goes into, into all the details if you want to do some um, background homework. No, it's all. So yeah, and so some, some other additional um, things that we did, uh, one thing is creating and calling out node modules down Bottom, we have a bunch of modules that we need to externalize. We're not going to bundle those. And then additionally, um, this is another secret. And I, I think that uh, Luca was really, really excited when he uh, found, identified this one, which was that you know, when you bundle code, it's faster from memory and then when you're, when you're executing it from your business budget. And you can use um, these libraries uh, that are available in the sandbox that are provided by AWS. But um, you get additional performance by bundling them um, if uh, if you bundle them with the code that you're uh, you're deploying. 
And moreover, I would add one thing that I think is interesting to know uh, in the, especially for JavaScript SDK, uh, we highly recommend to use the latest version because uh, we do optimization on the bundle size and uh, we tend to have, let's say, um, quite a lot of improvements overall. Uh, when we release a new version of the SDK, it's not automatically available in uh, in the sandbox at day one. Uh, it takes a bit for rolling out all the different uh, updates. But in general, if you are bundling uh, your SDK, um, bear in mind to update the latest version because you can have some uh, performance improvements out of the box as well. Yeah, that's one of the big benefits of Lambda because so much of it just gets upgraded automatically under the hood. You just get these performance uh, improvements for free. And I uh, I keep mentioning the, some of the stories I hear of people on the support line. I think they're the heroes. Can you imagine being on the AWS support line with all the number of products and features and people have to answer the questions and they get questions going, I think there's something wrong with my application or something's wrong with AWS. My <laughs> Lambda functions got much faster than I expected or event bridge is super fast. You're like, yeah, yeah that's just part of using a serverless service. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and one of the benefits uh, that we found was leveraging um, power tools. And we were uh, leveraging, which is really, if, you, if you're not aware, uh, it's just a developer toolkit, uh, which allows you to implement uh, serverless best practices, improves uh, developer velocity. But uh, what's interesting about it is that it's also great for uh, observability. There's a lot of libraries that are available so that you can automatically uh, get started. <clears throat> leveraging the observability tools like X-Ray, which we're going to show you um, in a couple of minutes on, on how we were able to um, measure performance uh, and really uh, identify cold starts. And so, so we could see when our application was performing uh, well and where we needed to make some uh, improvements. Also, we leveraged MIDI, uh, which is an open source uh, middleware tool. Yeah, I'll get the link for Power Tools. I'm just looking that up. But yeah, that is an amazing, just reduce so much reducing of code and reuse and observability and all those kind of things. So yeah, definitely get Power Tools a, a call. We've just had uh, one uh, question from Tony Awad. Thanks for joining us via YouTube, talking about the bundling the node models with the app. Do you mean the output will be one file with all the libraries included? Uh yeah, uh, that's one way to do that. But bear in mind, bundlers are extremely powerful because behind the scene, what happening, what's happening is that they are creating a graph of dependencies. And therefore, um, based on the bundle that you're using, you can, uh, um, let's say, decide which is the output. Just to give you an idea how powerful it is, uh, when you're using Webpack, uh, you can have a plugin uh, uh, where you can configure, let's say, how to slice and dice your, um, uh, your uh, final bundle. You can say, for instance, uh, I want to have a unique or I have I want to have a unique file or I want to have file of chunks of 500 kilobyte or one megabyte. Mm -hmm. So you can really decide the way how you are, uh, let's say, bundling or dividing your, your code in a nice way. Uh, and uh, later on, uh, there are, let's say, even more interesting approaches uh, uh, using, for instance, uh, other plugins like Mod Federation uh, that allows you to remotely call uh, Node.js files or JavaScript files uh, and takes care about the dependency management and uh, let's say the uh, load, let's say the load at runtime of the bundle of the, the JavaScript file, like it was natively bundled all together with the application. So there are a lot of techniques that you can handle when you leverage a bundle for or uh, let's say optimizing your code. Yeah, and I suppose it's different from uh, if you think of .NET with um, native AOT and with, my brain's gone mad, with a Java with GraalVN, for example, when that is actually creating a compiled binary of everything, you know, that is some other way to do it for, for some other kind the of- The beauty language. of dynamic languages. <laughs> yeah, there we go. <laughs> Uh, yeah, here's Power Tools for AWS. Uh, yeah, uh, there's actually a new documentation website as well, which you can link from these. Yeah, lots of great tools for uh, Power Tools for AWS. Have a look. Oh, and just quickly, Robert Tables, thanks for joining us again. Uh, we were talking about those SDK version things. Thanks for joining us from Twitch. For those who may who may strictly control versions, is there a way to subscribe to see these updates as they roll out? Yes, ish, sort of ish. You can see. Uh, basically, in the Lambda log lines, there is a version of the Lambda P 
package. Oh, I've got my, my terminology all wrong, but the, the the version of the the language runtime that we so the language runtime includes the operating system plus the SDK plus all the other stuff that we put into Lambda, and that that version is actually now uh, available in the logs. So you can actually parse the logs, and when that version number bumps up, you then know that there is a newer version. I'm not quite sure if we document yet which um, SDK version that corresponds to. Um, but yeah, you will know that something has been upgraded. Uh, so you, you may have some uh, visibility into that. But yeah, so it's, it's a bit of a, a yes issue. You'll know when it has been upgraded, but to what, um, uh, not necessary. All right. Well, and, and kind of talking about uh, power tools, um, we created some segments so that you can, inside X-Ray, you can, you can trace our function. Um, and this is really there to help us uh, look at the performance queries of our uh, AWS resources. And then additionally, you can use decorators inside classes uh, to call X-Ray. So is this the, the way to, before you're probably doing any kind of performance testing, is to understand what you've already got and have a way to measure it. So is X-Ray one of the places where you set up your tracing and at least you can then understand what time is being spent in init, what time is being spent in invoke, because if you're going to optimize you know, as much as you can out of init, but actually your init's really quick and you're, you've got some you know, blocking code within your function invoke, which is taking a lot of time, that's going to at least give you some indication of where you need to put your focus. Exactly. Yeah, that's that's correct. So the 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 thing that you need to know, uh, Julian, is that uh, in the past I've wrote also uh, a library of micro benchmarking for for JavaScript. Uh, it's open source, but yeah, it didn't have like a lot of traction. But mainly because uh, the challenge I had, I work a lot on low end devices uh, and uh, embedded devices. Therefore, even uh, a four cycle matters. Uh, so if you're using for each in JavaScript, is lower than four. That the classic four that you are going to write and stuff like that. Uh, so you need always to create a baseline when uh, you want to improve your uh, application. It doesn't matter what is the current baseline. You just need to understand where you are and if you are improving or not, uh, based on your ideas and thoughts on how to improve certain things. Mm -hmm. uh, and therefore, X-Ray, in our case, uh, was fantastic because it allowed us uh, to really, uh, let's say, capture chunk of statements that we, we were doing, like querying a database, for instance, and understand how fast we were going and if there were any optimization that we could do in every single part of our application. Cool. And yeah, and X-Ray is super cool, but also there are a lot of third-party tools which integrate really closely with Lambda that can also give you, you know, flame graphs and other kind of ways that you can um, have a look at your code or have a look at your um, performance. Absolutely. And actually, that's uh, kind of moves us well into kind of how we did our testing, and we can kind of show a little bit more detail around what that looked like. Because uh, we used an open source tool called Artillery uh, for load testing, and what it let us do is kind of not only pick the amount of time that uh, our tests were running, we ran them from between 45 seconds and two minutes, but we could also choose the number of virtual users. So we, we ranged anywhere from 20 to 100 virtual users, uh, kind of depending on the test. And so uh, to your earlier point, um, here's an example of where we were able to look in Logs Insight. We're able to see um, whether or not we have a cold start. And there's a, a link here uh, to get this query that you can run to identify those cold starts if you want to uh, be able to see them. So this is this is that same query that we ran each time. So in each of our different tests that we're going to run, uh, we're actually going to go through, run this query, and, and identify those cold starts. So let, let's take a look at our test. Um, so we had test one. So we had for uh, a 10-second ramp up, we had about 20 requests per second. Then we had a 50 second sustained test after, uh, run after that with about 50 requests per second. What was interesting about this was we had about 18 cold starts. And you can see that as we ramp up um, and we start to get uh, more and more environments available, uh, <clears throat> the actual requests and the number of cold starts goes down. So what we started to do was to look into these and so we started to look and say, OK, well, what if we were to actually look at these invocations individually? And to, to think about our application, what we were doing is we were uh, making uh, requests or queries uh, to our RDS database, and we were returning uh, 
NFL stadiums. And so those are pretty static. They're not going to change frequently. So our goal here was really to show how, how fast is, you know, what a typical read look like? What does that look like when you're trying to retrieve data as, um, as, as, as you get more and more requests, what does performance or how does performance change? So if we start looking at some of the, the specific in, invocations, we start to see, um, you know, we got about a minute and 43 seconds for our worst cold start. So this would be one invocation where that first invocation took a really long time. Next, we, we try to identify, okay, well, what was the best cold start? So if we knew what the worst one was, we started to look and say, okay, well, we had about a minute and 21 seconds on this invocation from, um, from an initialization all the way down uh, through uh, the actual execution of our code. And so we could see, and we're, we can actually, and I should have explained this a little bit earlier, so my apologies, where we're calling out and, and we're breaking out and showing what the invocation looks like, where do we uh, execute the handler? Where are we going to get parameters? So we're, we're trying to show what did each piece take and then what was the sum total of all of those inside that single invocation? So my apologies for not showing that or talking about that a little bit earlier. Next up, we go, go through and we look. And so now, now that we have a, an existing environment, we have those sandboxes established. You know, what was our worst warm start? Like what was the, the slowest time to run? We got about 228 milliseconds. But this is where it gets interesting, where for our best warm start, even for our unoptimized application, we were about 167 uh, milliseconds, which is you know, a lot better uh, than the minute and 43 seconds that it took for that initial cold start. And so what, what we're really showing and able to see is we're able to see very, very clearly um, that once the environment's established and it's able to, um, uh, to, to actually serve up all those requests, we, we can see that they're um, at about 100 and 160 milliseconds. So that was kind of our, our baseline. So then the, the next question became, okay, if we have a ramp, uh, situation, what happens if you just did 50 seconds of sustained for uh, 50 requests per second? So if you just give it a lot of traffic all at once. And our graph kind of shifts and you can see that our P P99 uh, comes in and you can now, you can also see that you get about 137 uh, cold starts. It's a lot, right? And that's just because it, it, it's not ramping up, rather it's, 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 a, it's a number of sustained requests all at once as if um, you know you just you just launched a new application and now you're you're starting to see or you launched a new feature and you had a lot of people checking that out there so you, you you'd actually see a, a you know, no ramp up you would just start to see a lot more traffic and so obviously the, the cold starts uh, were, were significant so the question became like okay how do we start to look at optimizing this solution what, what do we need to do and that's where Luca takes over to talk about um, making this a, a better solution or making it more optimized. Okay. And Ju Justin's correct when he says that one minute plus cold start seems excessively awful. <laughs> I would agree. So hopefully they're good uh, opportunities to fix that. Thanks for joining us, Justin. Okay. So uh, now let's move into the improvement. So first of all, I would like to ask you, including Julian, uh, how would you optimize okay. this workload? What are the, uh, let's say, common thoughts that immediately comes to your head and uh, you want to uh, to share in, in chat? So if you have yeah, any- Let us in the chat, you... yeah, let us know. Uh, first first yeah. impressions, you've looked at the at the x-ray trace. Did anybody spot anything? Were you looking on your small screen you couldn't read or you blew it up on your sort of 70 inch monitor? Um, yeah, any options in the chat? Um, yeah, we'd, lo we'd love to hear them. Um, well, I mean, I I'll go first. We obviously, talk, Matt obviously talked about the two different phases, the init yeah. and the invoke. Uh, there didn't seem to be much of a difference in that um, uh, in that part. And I think, yeah, Tony has sort of uh, alluded to that as well. There we go. So initialize the parameter store client outside the handler. That sounds like a good idea. Sounds, sounds a good suggestion. Tony, yeah. we will give you a million free Lambda revokes every month for the rest of your life for being first to <laughs> answer the questions. So thank you for that. <laughs> 
we, we, we would do even better. Uh, I think it's, it's a good start. So in the first example uh, that Matt just shared, it was outside. There is another thing that uh, I want to uh, highlight on that uh, that uh, is interesting. Maybe you ask yourself, oh, but uh, why didn't it show anything about secrets? Because uh, if you're using RDS proxy, uh, it takes care about the secrets for you. So that's another cool thing oh, that you can okay. have uh, about RDS proxy. It takes care about the certificates, takes care about uh, the, the secrets and uh, the um, connection pooling. Uh, and these three things usually are sometimes overlooked, sometimes a bit annoying to take care of. And it's probably this, an afterthought when you start to optimize your code. But if you have yeah, RDS that, proxy. That, that's a good point. I always think of <laughs> RDS proxy as the connection pooling and then the IAM simplification simplifying that. Yeah. But yeah, actually, the secrets manager built into it is, yeah, I, didn't, I don't know why I haven't thought of that. Nice one. It's, it's a new one, that one. And that therefore, it means uh, that on your code, uh, you don't have to create uh, an HTTP connection towards secrets manager, pooling yeah. every time and doing all that stuff. That will means that you are going to have way less strain towards the service, first of all. So if you have a lot of uh, Lambda functions that are going to be called, uh, in this case, you're going to simplify drastically uh, your, uh, let's say, challenge to scale your, your function. And also the code start would be, uh, let's say, uh, less prohibitive uh, because you are not going to call another service. OK, so I, I, I read quite a few interesting points that were raised. Uh, for instance, Graviton was another one. Uh, thanks, yeah. Anton, for sharing. Thanks, Anton, yeah. <laughs> OK, so let's, let's deep dive on the optimized solution, as we call it. Bear in mind that there isn't such optimized or not optimized. We just call it that way because for peace of mind, uh, we were trying to figure out how to call these two services. Before but the idea yeah. is we started uh, with the thought, OK, how, a, let's say, a developer would, uh, without, let's say, knowing Lambda inside out would work in such API. So now here, as you can see, there are a few differences. And uh, on top of uh, uh, what you are seeing here, that more or less is the same. There is just an elastic cache uh, icon that bubbled up uh, into the, the system. We will see in a moment why. Um, we uh, have also made another change. So we moved to Graviton. And Graviton is uh, the our, uh, let's say, Graviton 2 is uh, our um, uh, chipset that we have uh, created that is uh, pretty cool because if you don't have any specific library that are relying on x86 architecture, you can uh, switch easily uh, with uh, to uh, ARM and uh, and therefore an ARM architecture that is providing uh, up to 19% of better performance. If I remember well, Matt, right? I know that you're an expert on Graviton. Yeah. Cool. Uh, and also, obviously, uh, uh, cost optimization. That is always a nice, nice side effect when you're optimizing your, your workloads. OK, so as I said, we, uh, there is a brand new Elastic Cache uh, uh, implementation. Why that? Because the reality is, uh, uh, as Matt was saying, we were returning uh, always the same content uh, or potentially even similar content in other kind of APIs. Uh, but it was highly cacheable. Uh, and we wanted to have a solution that enables us not only to have one um, sandbox that stores in memory the response of that thing, because that means you're going to call for every new sandbox, first RDS, store in memory, and then deal with all the eviction of the cache and whatever. We wanted to have uh, the benefit that these cache was shared across all the sandboxes that were called at the same time. And therefore, uh, with Elastic Cache, you can implement one of my favorite patterns when it comes to scale uh, your APIs, that is the cache aside pattern. And the idea is very simple. So you first check in the cache if there is, uh, let's say, your response that you're looking for. Uh, and then uh, if not, you are going to, to call and query RDS, then store this information into the cache. And then from that point on, all the other, uh, your Lambda function and all the other Lambda functions that are going to uh, check inside the cache will have something that is warm. And obviously, because it's in a memory cache, it's extremely fast, as we will see later on in the result. The other thing that uh, um, uh, you know I'm, uh, I was quite used coming from uh, uh, the building low end, uh, building on top of low end devices, and when I say low end, it means like set of boxes 2015 uh, or 2013 um, that were extremely um, uh, less powerful than the, an iPhone nowadays. It's probably more than a Nokia, uh, uh, let's say, uh, phone. Uh, you have to look into the libraries, especially when we're talking about JavaScript. 
And uh, in this case, uh, I started to analyze that ESPL provides a very nice way to analyze uh, your your bundle or your your code. And what we dis what we were looking at is that we had like 1.6 meg of uh, bundle size for not much, honestly. It was just uh, let's say querying uh, through um, uh, SQLize our uh, Postgres database. That was it, honestly. We didn't do much magic over there. Yes, there were power tools, there were a bunch of other things, but in reality, not too much. So when we started to look into that, uh, I was thinking, okay, so what can we, uh, where are the, the low hanging fruit that we have there? And when I analyzed that, I discovered that PostgreSJS could be an alternative of SQLize. And the reason being is because in the second optimized version, we are using a new another technique that you can apply in JavaScript uh, that is tree shaking. And tree shaking, basically, if you're not familiar with the concept, is very simple. So if you have a library with 10 methods uh, and you just use one of those, you don't have to bundle the entire library. You just bundle the code that is needed for uh, functioning your Lambda function. And therefore, what we discovered that SQLize, that by the way, we choose that because it was the most used and uh, up-to-date uh, version of uh, uh, ORM uh, library for querying Postgres, and it was bubbling at the top of NPM when we were looking at it. Uh, it doesn't provide tree shaking because there is they're using a version of um, Moment.js that is a library for dates that doesn't allow you to do tree shaking. And therefore, when we move to Postgres.js, that does exactly the same thing. And uh, personally, I prefer that also because it's using a string literal that I really like to use when, when I, I'm querying, feel like uh, I'm querying normally uh, a database more than using magic methods. Um, it, it allows us to really reduce drastically the uh, bundle size. That means faster code start, therefore cheaper. Um, but more than that, this one is showing 246 kilobyte. It was less than that. It was 200 kilobyte less than that. Why that? Because after that, we started to introduce the Redis library and a few other things that we needed for implementing this new mm -hmm. architecture. But if I remove uh, literally changing the code from uh, uh, SQLize to Postgres.js, move the bundle size from 1.6 meg to 40 kilobytes. That was ridiculous. The amount of uh, time that I have seen, uh, let's say, code that is bundled with arbitrarily without thinking about the libraries that we're using is incredible. So we really need to make an effort here. And there are all the tools available uh, for validating that what we are putting in our Lambda function is exactly what we need to put inside it. So it's being so, efficient, with your, efficient with what you bundle into your packet in, in, yes. in as many ways as you can. Absolutely. Absolutely. You need to use all your uh, tricks. Um, and just uh, session Doshi came just with, in with us. Sorry to jump in because we were talking yeah. about the ORM. What tools do you recommend for CI/CD for your database? Does ORM do it for you automatically? Session, I'm not quite sure I understand the connection with the ORM and CI/CD database. But are, are you thinking to when you are injecting uh, the credentials through CI/CD? Is it that question? Yeah, I don't know. Session, let us know, and we'll yeah, we'll yeah, be exactly. happy to help if we can have some more info. Absolutely. So now the bundling is slightly different now. Uh, so we maintain the minification. Yeah, we, we really like that. But we had another thing that is not exposed uh, uh, by our, um, uh, let's say, APIs, uh, that is the tree shaking. So if you go to the ES build uh, website, you can find a lot of flags that you can apply to your bundler. And one of them that is not exposed into this uh, uh, Node.js function is the tree shaking part. And tree shaking is the mechanism that they expose. So in order to do that, you just need to add as a flag so you can use that uh, properly. Uh, the other thing is uh, with, with Math, at the beginning, when we were building the first uh, version, that what we call the uh, unoptimized version, um, we just guesstimate the, the, the Lambda size, uh, the memory size of our Lambda. Uh, and what it means is that we said, OK, so probably we don't start from the very bottom. We just bump up a little bit. Uh, but as you can see, we the first Lambda function has 256 uh, megabyte of memory. But as you can see from this graph, uh, you have like uh, a, not a very, uh, let's say, uh, performant uh, Lambda function because uh, it's probably the worst that we have. And it costs exactly as much as, uh, uh, or probably slightly more than the 512 megabytes. What does it tell us this? It means that not, it is not, 
uh, let's say linear, the idea of having larger memory size means more expensive. It's actually potentially could be the opposite. And that's the cool thing uh, here that we need to take away. So in this case, we are using power tuning. That is an open source uh, tool or, or library that is available uh, for all of you. Some We have some customers that are using even the CI CD for, in order to always check uh, that the memory is optimized properly for either execution or for cost. But here, with just bump, uh, bumping up the memory size to four, four, 512 megabytes, we could have, let's say, uh, same cost, but way better performances. So this time, we applied power tuning to the new workload when it was, uh, let's say, uh, finalized and implementing all the new feature. And we found this sweet spot uh, that allowed us to optimize uh, very nicely the invocation time. So we can bump up to 1 gig. Uh, or 500 uh, megabyte, and we have like very nice response time as we are going to see in a second for the same price point. That is always nice. And that also means that Sushan Patil also won uh, a million free Lambda invocations every single month. Uh, because when we were um, asking earlier for the good suggestions, increase the Lambda <laughs> memory uh, could be super helpful. Uh, but this is a, a way to do it programmatically where you can actually use data to do that rather than just doing it manually. So yeah. Uh, Lambda yeah. power tuning is super helpful. Uh, well done, Sushant. We um, appreciate your feedback. Your uh, well, your your ideas and suggestions. Doing well. So the, the other thing uh, uh, that we were discussing with Matt while we were building this optimized solution was, can we do something better than using the SDK to call parameter store and potentially secrets manager? And uh, uh, the answer that we, we found was, yes, we can do something better. Uh, so we can use an extension. Uh, why that? In the extension is nothing more than a sub-process that is available uh, for Lambda. Uh, and uh, the beauty of this uh, approach is that we can run some code before the initialization phase um, of the Lambda function. If you remember what Matt showed at the beginning, uh, the extension is the very first thing that we load inside the, the, the sandbox. And uh, uh, it takes care about uh, building itself. And it is available for the entire duration of uh, a, 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 a sandbox lifecycle. The beauty of this is there is an extension that is, uh, let's say, provided by AWS uh, by the same team of uh, Parameter Store that takes care about uh, um, integrating with the Secrets Manager and Parameter Store. And the beauty of this is that basically it spin up uh, um, a, a web server that is local in localhost is exposing to a specific port uh, the call to these services, but it takes care also to cache the response. As you can see in these uh, three lines that are highlighted, you have the port, you have the level of uh, logs that you want to have, and the TTL, so the time to leave of a specific information. And that is great because otherwise, this stuff you need to build in, in your Lambda function. And imagine you have like multiple teams, it has to do that every single time. That means probably you, at some point you will abstract in a library, but Dealing with external dependencies in distributed system is not a breeze. And having instead something that you just uh, put inside your um, uh, inside your Lambda function through uh, a, an extension, uh, it becomes a breeze because the reality is owned by the same team that is dealing with this kind of stuff. And therefore, you just need to bump up the next version and configure properly your system. And automatically, you have all the TTL that is handled. That means less strain towards these services that at scale matters. So here you can find a bunch of uh, parameters that you can tweak inside the extension. That is something that uh, I found extremely helpful, uh, so especially because they expose what I, I care about, the TL, uh, the port, and the uh, log level uh, info. So that's uh, uh, super cool. So in order to communicate, this is just the code that you need. So now you don't communicate anymore inside um, with the, the um, uh, service directly, but you just call a local host, like classic, uh, fetch that you have in uh, Node.js or TypeScript. Uh, and uh, you have to remember to pass the token that is available uh, in the environment variable uh, of the Lambda function. Uh, and then you pass as a header, and basically you get back the parameter uh, that you're looking for. As simple as that. Obviously, it, when it's cache, it's faster to respond. So therefore, you are in a very great shape with your performance. Now, here are the, the catch, right? So we started to do exactly the same test with uh, this new Lambda function. So first of all, we halved 
uh, the completely the number of cold starts. If you remember, Matt showed 18 cold starts uh, in the first test when we were ramping up uh, gently uh, from uh, um, uh, zero to 20 requests per second, and then uh, we moved to sustain. And that's a really good uh, value. Oh, yes. Another thing is uh, P99. If you remember, it was over se one second or something, if I remember well, uh, two seconds probably, Matt. Um, now, look at the P99. It's ridiculous low. Uh, and uh, moreover, when we start to look in details in X-ray about the um, performance, you see that here is 794 millisecond the worst cold start. The best cold start was half a second. That's so the worst cold start. Was that the one that was one minute or? No, it was one in 21 second. What, okay. 1.43 seconds, yeah. Yeah. Okay, 1.43 seconds. So yeah, quite a big change. Yes. So we already we already start to move the needle. But the interesting point, because remember the cold start are not the majority of your uh let's say um API call. So it's usually uh we know that is a single digit percentage of your API calls because then you have an execution environment that's there and uh, you need to uh it would be available to respond to more um uh, let's say uh, requests. And uh, let's move to the warm start that is the the path that is more hit. So now we are moving into 73 milliseconds that if you ask me, it's pretty good despite it's a simple API. But yeah, we now we now have obviously uh, the cache aside pattern that is helping a lot and all the optimization that we discussed before. But let's look at the best warm start. I think the result speaks by itself, right? So it, we're talking about TypeScript and, uh, and Node.js, heavily optimized, wherever, but we're talking about six milliseconds. So now we have a heavily optimized uh, response time for a, a simple uh, a REST API that is returning data from, from Postgres. That is, I think, a pretty cool result overall, starting from what any other developer would do and starting to apply just the best practices that you find in several of our uh, websites. Yeah, that's quite a that's quite a change. <laughs> <laughs> so now I know where what you're thinking because you say okay. So if uh, uh, because remember when you're thinking about transaction per seconds uh, and you build an API with Lambda, you cannot say one second it means one transaction. Sorry, it means one execution environment because it's very fast to respond. Then obviously one execution environment can handle more responses and that's how it's getting way interesting when you optimize because you're thinking okay so if i have a sandbox with a default concurrency limit that is a soft limit by the way i know that sometimes people are thinking that it's a hard limit it's not it's a soft limit so you can request uh to increase the limit of uh, your lambda functions um if i have like 100 millisecond response time uh that probably uh, is equal to every sandbox can have 10 tps given or take, obviously it depends from the oscillation of, of the response time and uh, how you've written your code and a few stuff, but in an ideal world, that is how it looks like. But what happens if you have it? So if you if you really have 50 milliseconds response time, you would say that will be you will have way more. Okay, so there is a catch also here. In the documentation, if you see it here, there is uh, these two lines that is telling you that we guarantee uh, that we have 10 requests per second per sandbox. Uh, however, in our test, we have seen constantly that we're more, especially in the, um, uh, let's say, uh, optimized version. Obviously, it uh, depends from uh, the moment that you were handling that and everything, but I think uh, it's very great to understand that if you're optimizing uh, your, your code, that means less code start. That means it could be cheaper and you can have way more response inside your, uh, let's say, uh, um, Lambda functions have your workloads. That is exactly the reason why we start to optimize code. Okay, so test two, that's the uh, the interesting one. So in this test two, as Matt was saying before, uh, we move from zero to uh, 50 uh, requests per second straight away, okay? Uh, so we expect to have a lot of code stars. In reality, not as many as we expected, right? So uh, also the response time, yes, degraded a bit instead of having the gentle uh, ramp up that we have before, but still we are talking uh, in a region of, I don't know, 200 milliseconds, something like that. That is fantastic. 
um, if we compare even further, just to have, let's say, a comparison, um, the, the two workloads, uh, we have like an uh, unoptimized um, warm start that is on average uh, at 268 milliseconds, and the optimized one was on average 16.5 milliseconds. And when we, we have also done one thing, because obviously uh, Matt and I we were discussing for quite a few nights uh the the discuss the the how we could uh provide let's say some valuable numbers mm -hmm. here and uh, uh one thing that we uh, we we have exposed was uh, a, a feature flag that allowed us to turn on and off the uh, the cache so here you can see the value with or without the cache so even the optimized without cache it was pretty fast 124 um, milliseconds on average but with the cache we really made an impact there so that doesn't mean you always have to have the cache up running. Mm -hmm. However, um, it also means that uh, um, you can have better performances uh, in, in this case if you have uh, a cache mechanism. We use Elastic Cache, but it could be memory, it could be different things. So it depends how you want to optimize that. So uh, big results here. So we move the needle of the uh, code starts of 55%. That is pretty great. With bunch of optimization, nothing crazy as you have seen. But we move the needle even further when we talk about warm starts. Um, so all of this code and uh, this example uh, is well written in an article that Matt and I uh, wrote. Uh, that is available on community.aws, and probably Julian now is showing the um, the link coming up, right? And we have also in that article the link that uh, uh, you can uh, uh, go and see. Uh, the GitHub repository where you see all the code and everything we have done as described in this um, office hour. And I think, you know, if you have any uh, suggestion or improvement or anything else that you want uh, to, to see, I think the mother and I will, will be more than happy to answer any question now and also uh, remotely if, uh, if, let's say, we are not able to cover everything uh, during this office hour. Excellent. Well, so, yeah, I mean, that's super interesting because, I you know, a lot, well, a lot of people are worried or doing a lot of work for the cold start optimization and then thinking that's the sort of job done. But I mean, to have such a sort of warm start optimization, in fact, that's probably going to be more impactful because that's on every request to your API, uh, every single invoke of the Lambda function, that's going to make a sort of massive difference to your end-to-end -end, uh, throughput, really. That's right. And what was nice about that is when we were able to use power tuning at that point to, to optimize the memory, it then allowed you to figure out, you know, to shorten that invocation time. So it actually saved you money by spending yeah. a little bit more money up front uh, during the invocation, it shortened, it shortened the actual life cycle of it. Okay. Uh, yeah, one of the questions I was thinking about the, the use of the cache and using a uh, Elastic Cache or that, or that kind of thing. Um, what, what's the decision tree on just loading something in the initialization phase or actually using a cache? Is it just the the time that how long the cache is going to be uh, updated for? If something is really static, you know, if you if you've got a value that really never changes, do you just do that in the init? Um, yeah, what, what's the sort of wh when do you start introducing a cache to do something? How dynamic does your information need to be? Um, <clears throat> there are it's it's not a decision tree. It's more complex. It's a graph, I would say. <laughs> but always do it in that way. Uh, it depends. You have different <laughs> level of caches, right? So you can cache at the very entry point of your application that could be at the CDN level. So in that case, uh, you can cache the entire response uh, and uh, set up a TTL on, on that side. And that would be great. So also if you have a dynamic, so one thing that very often people forget is if you have like a, a read request that is very dynamic, um, there is, uh, unless it's per completely personalized per user, and therefore is really personal, not segmented, that is different. We need to bear in mind that we can have a bit of uh, caching that could be as short as 30 seconds, but that will, uh, especially if you have a spiky workload, will save uh, a lot of uh, requests to origin and therefore to your Lambda function straight away. Another layer could be at the API gateway level if you're using API gateway. Uh, or like in our case, we wanted to show the cache aside pattern because to a certain extent is the most dynamic one because potentially you can even have like a, a more complex logic where you cache a portion of the response uh, and then you, you retrieve the rest from a more simpler query. So in both cases, um, we want to emphasize the fact that caching can be applied in, in different parts of the journey of a request. Yeah. Uh, but 
you leveraging that uh, will enable you to uh, really have your uh, lambda function response uh, very quick. And that's for me the, the 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 key takeaway because very often we forget that also st storing uh, st stale uh, data for a few seconds can really have a massive impact uh, on the cost, on the response time of your API and so on and so forth. And when I was in my previous company, I was working in um, live sports streaming. Uh, and therefore, we have real-time data that we need to show, the real-time catalog, for instance. But we were caching uh, the, the catalog uh, for a minute or so. Because that mean allowed us to, uh, let's say, handle the, the large spike of customers that were coming to or into our platform uh, during peak time when we have the kickoff of a match or the Super Bowl or whatever it was. Uh, and that trick that was very simple allowed us to really scale our architecture to millions of requests without too much burden. <clears throat> Excellent. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, we've got a question from Leo uh, Leo from Twitch. Thanks so much. Can you provide guidance on the advantages and disadvantages of requesting an increase in a soft limit for, for concurrent Lambda executions within an existing account versus segregating our service architectures across multiple accounts? <clears throat> That's an interesting one. Um, so let's put in this way, uh, obviously you need to, if you have uh, everything in one single account, uh, you might request like big numbers, uh, and therefore, um, you, we, we have to, uh, understand that obviously there are certain, uh, values that, uh, can be, uh, easy. So if you move from 1000 to 2000, uh, probably it's not a big deal, so it would be granted very, very quickly. But when you start to increase uh, way more, then you have you need to have justification that you need to provide in your ticket, and therefore it makes your life more complicated. Moreover, uh, when you think about uh, uh, multi-account, multi-account is a very nice strategy when you're working in distributed system because uh, you can really provide and tweak the and tune the, uh, uh, let's say, metrics and um, uh, let's say limits uh, and quotas in the way that you need for a specific workload. Because in my experience uh, in the handling large distributed system, not all the APIs are called the same. There are some of them that are, uh, let's say, rarely called, and some others are in, in what I called uh, the uh, hot path. Uh, and therefore, it's very important that uh, if you're capable to divide multiple account, then it will make your life easier uh, for the quotas and handling the, the different things. Because if you have everything in, in all the eggs in the same basket, you might risk that you need to request a large quota just for one function or a couple of them that, that are in the hot path and request more, uh, let's say, executions. Yeah, definitely. Well, and also with multi-account strategy, especially if you divide it up by uh, the type of environment, if you have a lower environment, like a dev environment, in one account and production in another, that can also help segregate that as well. And, and multi-account strategy is, just like you mentioned, is, is, is really the way to go. Yeah, thanks, Robert, for your uh, input as well. Yeah, multi-account, there's so many other kind of things, and that's also security boundaries and team boundaries that some you know developers are not going to tramp over each other's toes. You can do load testing in different accounts, all these kind of things. But uh, yes, if you do have some, if you can, if you can handle the bigger limits, uh, and you need bigger limits in a single account, absolutely go for it. You know, Lambda can have huge account concurrency if, if you do need it. Um, but the more you squish into that single account, the you know the more toes you're going to be uh, stepping on. So that can be the thing. Well, we've had a super useful uh, hour. There's been lots of links we've been putting uh, putting there as well. Uh, just to talk about what's come before we say goodbye to uh, Luca and Matt, what's talk coming up next week? We're talking more about APIs. We've got the expert, Zach Burns, who's going to be talking about building well-architected API gateway APIs. Um, so yeah, that'll be fantastic. Zach's been on Office Hours before and is a font of all knowledge to do all things APIs. Don't forget EDA uh, London. I would love to see you on May the 4th in Kono. That would be super good. Uh, don't forget serverlessland.com, everything there is to know about serverless on AWS. In fact, that is, I can see that screenshot is slightly out of date because actually we've created some product pages. And there's a service on product pages where you can look at Lambda. For example, and under Lambda, we've got pages now for Java and .NET and a Python, I think. And we're going to be expanding to uh, additional languages. And also event bridge and step functions and all these kind of things with some really curated uh, blog posts and videos and learning guides and code examples and everything, uh, which can be super helpful to uh, help you build your applications. But yeah, thanks so much for all your questions and comments today. Most importantly, thank for uh, Luca and Matt for dropping all their awesome knowledge, uh, all the links. What's, what's cool is there's a GitHub repo. You can go and play with these things themselves. I think uh, it was 
actually some really sort of nice, more advanced kind of things where you can look at the, you know, the, the ES build and the tree shaking and the bundling and the optimization of your code. Uh, there are lots of other resources on adding memory and using other languages and, you know, optimizing how your functions actually run. So yeah, this was another, another deep dive take, which we appreciate. So yeah, Matt, Luca, thanks so much for coming on Office Hours. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. And everybody else, we'll see you same time, same place next week for another uh, version of Office Hours where we're going to be talking all about APIs. So enjoy the rest of your week and uh, happy building.